And Ashwin, the pressure is on us. Just like deadlines and management pressure and, and placement day pressure and you wrapping up your book and me wrapping up my TV show, the pressure is on us because we're the first session, we set the bar high. Are you all set? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, and I must tell you this. This has been, when we do these events, we often have a room out there where we have several conversations. But sometimes when you meet someone as dynamic as Ashwin backstage, you don't need to prep for these conversations. We've actually not prepped. We've not, full disclosure. We've not prepped. And you know, it's a, it's a lovely little nomenclature that the teams come up with. But let's get to business. Ashwin, I didn't do an MBA. I went to law school. Okay. Did I make a mistake in this long meandering course to become Yes, you did. Uh, but but <laughs> uh, when I went for an MBA, I had no clue that I was going to be uh, becoming a writer one day. Uh, so uh, uh, in those days, the Yale School of Management, which is where I did my MBA from, uh, they prided themselves on not having an MBA degree, they used to call it an MPPM, mm -hmm. which meant a master's in public and private management, All right. uh, to differentiate themselves from the standard MBA because they used to draw a certain portion of the class from uh, the public and not-for-profit not sectors. Uh, but within the, within the lot of people who were from the private sector, we used to say that MPPM stands for more power, prestige, and money. Uh, so effectively, uh, we worked towards that. I came out of that program. Uh, the, the idea of being a writer or being a storyteller mm -hmm. was the furthest thing from my mind. Uh, I went into the world of business, and that's pretty much where I stayed for the next 10 or 15 years till the time that a story struck me. That's a fascinating journey, but what I want to understand from you is in your books, you know, you explore all sorts of history, crime, mythology. Some of these themes aren't necessarily taught at B-School, right? But I think that there's a lot of learnings from a lot of your works. Do you think that there's some way to integrate some of these storytelling forms which would be beneficial to India's next gen of B-School aspirants? Oh, absolutely. At the end of the day, the shortest distance between two people is a story. So. Uh, whether it comes down to marketing something, whether it comes down to convincing someone regarding a certain viewpoint, the best way to go about doing it is through a story. Uh, even though I had a typical South Bombay education, cathedral school, <laughs> St. Xavier's College, then followed it up with an MBA degree at Yale, uh, you know, even though that is supposedly what was my education, what was going on in parallel during my, during my growing up years right. was the fact that I had uh, a, a grand uncle uh, who was uh, willing to invest his time in exposing me to books. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, my father always wanted me to go and work at his office and he would always say that the only two words that you need to learn are debit and credit. As long as you have that, everything else will be sorted out. Uh, and on the other hand, my Nanaji would be sending me books like uh, War and Peace. Mm. Uh, and he would be sending me uh, the Mahabharat retold. During his lifetime, he sent me more than 300 books. And that was the real education, those stories that he sent me. And, you know, I would always have a confusion in my mind uh, because there, in our office, we had this Munimji. He used to wear a kala topi. And uh, he would always tell me uh, that, uh, listen, you know, you're wasting your time because bookkeeping is more important than book reading. And he would say, uh, if you have to read something, then read a balance sheet. Mm. That will get you somewhere. So there was this cultural dichotomy. Uh, and then I would go back to my Nanaji. And I would say, Nanaji, this is what he is saying. And he says that I'm wasting my time with your books. And Nanaji said something very interesting. He said, you know, beta, in our mythology, in our itihas, in our Purans, in our, in our entire thought process, right. uh, we have uh, two Devis, Lakshmi and Saraswati. And both 
uh, have a very curious relationship. Uh, Lakshmi is always curious about where Saraswati happens to be. So if Saraswati is in this room, then Lakshmi wants to come into this room. And if Saraswati gets up and goes away, then Lakshmi also gets up and goes away because she's curious, where has she gone? So he said, the sure shot way of attracting Lakshmi is by attracting Saraswati first. Uh, and he said, you know what? In our, uh, in our th thought process and in our world view, the only deity who can sit in the middle of Lakshmi and Saraswati is Ganesha. That's why we call it Shublab. And that's why I joke that probably I look the way I do because my entire life has been a quest of Lakshmi and Saraswati. <laughs> so that, that's the way it is. Several revelations there and you know, being a, a North Indian growing up in South Bombay from a school that you didn't go to because my parents consciously decided not to send me there. Great school though, but a rival school for me. That said, Ashwin, credit debit is the one thing I didn't understand. All right. And for a lot of us who go through, you know, the, the entire rigmarole of preparing for our bachelor's degrees, a lot of us want to do engineering, law school, some of us make that mistake. Uh, and then, of course, the other things that we do in the sciences. Do you think that the process has become so regimented that sometimes we need to go to finishing school or our master's or PhD programs to pick up some of these learnings that we inherently grew up with? So, I'll, I'm just going to fast forward. Uh, the, the year was 2008 when I actually had my first book published. She's wanting to slip you something. It's a secret note. It is. It's, it's a pop quiz that we'll be using with you a little later. But, so, but for now, we get back to your story. She, so, 2008, and my book had, for the first time, come into the market. And uh, uh, I started doing the rounds of bookstores. Uh, because I was very curious that is my book available or not. So I would go into bookstores and I would say, you know what, there is this fantastic new author called Ashwin Sanghi. <laughs> and I'm just wondering whether you have any stock of his books. Uh, and uh, very often they would look at the computer and they'd say, yes, we have three units. And they are, you know, you'd need Google Maps to try and figure out where those books were located because it would be in some dusty corner. Um, and I would pick up those books, run my kerchief over them, remove the dust, and bring them in the front of the store. And I would do that repeatedly. Uh, very often, I would even put it on the bestseller rack. Uh, and um, uh, someone asked me, they said, you know, you've, you've done the better part of a year. Wherever you travel, you go to bookstores and you do this. And I said, you know what? During my years of growing up, my father always used to tell me, jo dikta hai, wo bikta hai. And so in intrinsically, that, that was there in my mind. Now, that sort of a marketing principle, yeah. uh, I may have tucked it away uh, to the furthest recesses of my brain, but whether I, you know, I'm one of those very few authors who actually writes my plot outlines in Excel, because that's what I'm most comfortable with. Uh, and with, the literary community is shocked, uh, because I'm, so completely far removed from the way that they would plot or plan a story. Mm -hmm. uh, so to my mind, there are many, many things that you pick up in a master's program, which uh, stay with you for many, many years thereafter. Right. And you don't know how they will eventually play out. Uh, I would have been given up for dead after that first book because it didn't do well. Uh, but I chugged on. And I think a lot of that was again to do with my training. And that first book becomes a very important segue in the conversation because a lot of us in the media, a lot of us startup founders often need to figure out resilience. But the first point to resilience is often rejection or failure. And with that first book, Ashwin, it was no easy task actually getting it published. That's some place which was, I would imagine, uh, a very critical turning point for you where you could deal with failure and become the success, success, successful author. I think you need to, Ayush, you need to figure out ways to psych yourself to keep going when the world is against you. Uh, so I had no literary background. I didn't come from a writer family. Uh, uh, there was no credentials. 
to speak off. Uh, I remember when the Rosaba line came out and I held my first press conference, one of the press wallas, a cheeky fellow, he asked me, he said, you have no credentials, you have an MBA in finance and you write this theological mystery and you expect us to somehow or the other take you seriously. Uh, what are your qualifications to write this? And I said, you know what? During my growing up years, my mother always used to tell me that I was a bloody good liar. I could always tell a lie with a straight face. And somehow or the other, I would make you believe the story. Uh, and it is that storytelling skill. Because you know what? In the sort of genre that I write, uh, it's a mixture of uh, myth and history. I've always said that my formula is myth plus history is equal to mystery. Correct? Uh, and that's what I do. I try and look for those overlap areas. Uh, one of the things uh, is that, uh, you know, when, when you are going to tell a lie, then you need to figure out a way to tell that lie close to the truth. Because then it makes that lie believable. And that's what I do through my research. So all of that was my situation when that first book came out. But to get to that first book, uh, I started writing the Rosabal line sometime around 2003. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a, a whole different story as to why I wrote it and how it came about. Uh, but after I was done writing it in 2005, I started applying to the literary agents and the publishers and the rejection started coming in, and not only that, vast majority didn't even reply. Uh, and when people used to come into my uh, study, they would find a bulletin board, and on that bulletin board there were numbers, 12, 18, 30, 33, 38. So people would ask me, what is this number? So I would say, you know, 12 was the number of times that the first book in the Harry Potter series was rejected, <laughs> the J.K. Rowling book. And 18 was uh, the number of times that uh, the, uh, the first book of Stephen King, uh, Carrie, was rejected. And uh, 33 was the number of times that Chicken Soup for the Soul was rejected. And uh, 38 was the number of times that Gone with the Wind was rejected. And so I had these numbers to psych myself and I said, I'm doing damn well. Probably I'm going to beat these people in terms of the number of rejections that are coming in. But undoubtedly, there were times when I was very down. Our house was a very good friend of mine. So he would come on Fridays or Saturdays and they would uh, pour whiskeys for each other. Um, and uh, uh, they were very generous with one another. Uh, they would pour these, uh, 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 these very extra generous large pegs. And... Um, this gentleman, he asked me one day, he said, Beta, tum bade depressed lag rahe ho. What is the matter? I said, you know, uncle, I'm not getting published. What do I do? And uh, he said, uh, you know, one thing I want to tell you, that in life, 99% mm -hmm. is about good luck. So I said, but then what about the balance 1%? That 1% must be hard work, efficiency, management, networking, resources. So, you know what, Ayush, he picked up his whiskey. He downed it in one shot. It, this was a very large peg. He downed it, then put down the glass. He said 99% is good luck and 1% is bloody good luck. Wait for your 1% bloody good luck to kick in. And that is what very many youngsters right. don't wait for. They give up. They think that you know, they can manage the timing. The timing is not in your hands. You just keep chugging away. And that 1% eventually kicks in. Absolutely brilliant. That deserves a round of applause. And that really stems from the fact that Ashwin is a stellar storyteller. And for me, someone who tells stories for a living, I was just listening with goosebumps throughout. And I appreciate that, Ashwin. But that's the skill that I want to touch upon, storytelling. Now, someone says, oh, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, I'm an engineer. Be school and storytelling. How crucial a combination is that for our curriculum going forward? And how important is it for all of us to be good storytellers to genuinely, you know, get the best out of life? 
I think it's about being able to convey your point of view. So, for example, I remember after I started writing these novels which were based on history and mythology, someone asked me, they, they said, do you, do you think, do you believe in your stories? Do you believe in what you write? And so, I ended up telling them a story. Uh, and this was a real story which happened with me after the Rosabal line and Chanakya's chant had already got published. And I had gone to Kolkata in order to deliver a lecture. And I had half a day free and I, you know, had time to kill. So I told the driver, I said, take me around Calcutta and show me a little bit. So he said, where do you want to go? I said, kahi par bhi chalo. He said, saab aap mandir jayenge. I said, chalye, mandir chalte hain. So now when you're in Kolkata, you assume ki it is going to be a Durga Kali Mandir. He took me to this place which didn't look like a mandir. It was a 15 foot by 15 foot structure, whitewashed walls with a few steps leading up and I couldn't make out that it's a mandir. I went in there and there was this big green colored throne. And on that green colored throne, of course there was a deity and people were doing Aarti and Puja and Ucharan and all of that was going on. And then I looked closely and I realized that on that throne, there was a portrait of Amitabh Bachchan. So he had brought me to a Bachchan temple. For a minute, I pinched myself. I said, you know, is this real? Is this happening? And I came down, I came out of the temple and I was waiting for the car to come and pick me up. And this little boy came along uh, with a basket of stuff that I would have otherwise needed to go inside. Agarbattis and prashad and pool and all of that. I didn't pick up any of that. But one of the very interesting items he had out there was a little booklet which I did pick up and it was called the Amitabh Chalisa. And I put it very carefully in my library, it's still there. And that's the moment I started thinking to myself. I said, you know, I could see the car coming to pick me up and I thought, you know, Ashwin, what if this car, the driver loses control of the brakes and he comes and he knocks you down and you die on the spot and you take birth a thousand years later and a thousand years later, the cult of Amitabh worship has really caught on. Now, there isn't one temple for Amitabh, there are one lakh temples and it's a big thing. And someone taps you on the shoulder and asks you, could Amitabh have been a real man in history? And that's precisely the question we are asking about Ram or Krishna. And that is the story which I narrate to people who ask me, are your stories based on reality? Now, I could not explain that in a better way without that story. So that is where the story comes in. It enables you to be able to communicate at a completely different level. So a keen observer is, is one of the key traits of Ashwin Sanghi. That's how you get into the mind of a brilliant author like you. But you've had a long meandering path, Ashwin, getting here. Growing up in South Bombay, then heading to Yale, doing your MBA, and then, like you said, managing the family business, a long, illustrious line of businesses in Mumbai and beyond. And then you ended up sort of putting that on the back burner and then saying, hey, yeah. I want to essentially write books. So my point being that if we go through the traditional regimented systems that have existed uh, in pop culture and here in India, that's not necessarily the way forward, is it? No, it's not. And it worked out well for you. It worked out well for me. But you know, the, the truth of the matter is, Ayush, that there are so many people who unfortunately feel that because they've gone through a certain education, they feel that somehow that becomes the golden handcuff which holds them to that particular domain. Whereas for me, that was never the case. I mean, uh, okay, let, can I tell you a little bit about how I went into the world of writing? Absolutely. I was there for a business conference in Srinagar. I wasn't there on a writing trip. I wasn't even a writer. I hadn't written anything longer than a couple of pages. Uh, I was in Srinagar on account of a conference. I ended up going there. I, my flight back to Bombay got cancelled. So again, I had time. I got out again in the car 
and I told the driver, I said, let's drive around. This was around 2002. Uh, and it was peak militancy, so getting around was difficult. And he took me to this tomb in the heart of Srinagar, which is known as Rozabal. And Rozabal means tomb of the prophet. The interesting thing is that there is a peer, a Muslim peer from the 13th century who's buried there. His name is Nasiruddin. But there is an earlier burial which dates back to the origin of the tomb, which is 112 AD, so 2000 years old. And that is not an Islamic burial, but an east-west burial, not with the head pointing towards Mecca, but east-west, which is an ancient Jewish custom. And outside the tomb, there is a metallic plate which has a pair of human feet with the cross marks indicating where the nails for a crucifixion would have been hammered. And the common folklore is that this was the final resting place of Jesus Christ. And people, I want to tell you today that, you know, we think that we go out looking for stories. No, don't make that mistake. We don't look for stories. Stories look for us. Stories come looking for us. It's just that we don't know that that story is looking for us. So that story came looking for me. And then I ended up spending another year and a half. Now, that's again where the MBA came in. Because had it not been for that discipline, that rigor of research, during that 18 months, I must have read at least 50 plus books on various related subjects. I must have picked up the phone and spoken to probably at least another few dozen people who were more knowledgeable about it than me. Eventually, it reached a point where my wife said, you know, Ashwin, it's impossible to have a conversation with you because the only thing you want to talk about is the tomb. You have to find a way to get this out of your system. And that's when I started actually writing up a thesis. I was writing up a thesis to be able to prove to myself that there was something more than what meets the eye. This wasn't on an Excel sheet, though. The, but partly Excel, <laughs> partly Word. And uh, I gave it to my wife and I said, read it. And the next morning she said, congratulations. So I was very happy. I said, that means she's liked it. And then she turns around and says, no, no, congratulations, because I think, Ashwin Sanghi, you have discovered the cure for insomnia. It is so utterly boring. Within the first couple of pages, I was out for the count. She said, who's going to read this? And that was the moment it struck me that if I want this material to reach people, I have to tell a story. I cannot simply produce a bunch of facts. That's what I did. So for me, storytelling will always be an integral part of my life. Mm -hmm. Ashwin, it's interesting because, you know, I do a technology show for the India Today group, and I'm always curious about trends in the world of technology, disruptions as well. With what's happening in the world of artificial intelligence and with chat GPT and all these other systems, you'd imagine that the literary world would be immune to it to a large extent. But then when you visit the US and you see the writers guild up in arms saying, how can you let these AI systems take away our jobs? Yes. Then you feel maybe there is a genuine cause for concern. As someone who has managed to really build a stellar career, career an illustrious career um, in literature, as an author for the last 15 years, now when this technology disruption is coming your way, does that worry you a little bit? You know, it, it's like to a very great extent when, when Google happened, a lot of people said that, you know, this takes away from the rigor of research because you can simply Google it. But then what eventually happened? Google and Wikipedia became the starting point of your research. So you could never depend upon what the pages that they were throwing up, but it gave you a very good starting point. Similarly, I mean, over the last couple of months, I've been using chat GPT a lot, uh, because very often uh, I may want something very, like for example, the other day, I, I'm, this end of this year, I've got a crime thriller coming out, and I'm editing a portion of it, and I wanted to know how much time does it take to drain the blood from a human being. And uh, in the event of a ghastly, gruesome murder. And Chat GPT said, sorry, I'm not allowed to answer those sort of questions. Uh, so then I had to clarify that this is for a novel. So could you please, you know. Uh, and that, it was able to give me that. Very often, uh, 
uh, there is a place that I have not visited where I simply want the first three lines in terms of what's most interesting about a place. So I think these are tools. If you can use those tools, you can actually enhance your work. Uh, but if you start using the tool as almost the end all and be all, for example, if you read a book which has been researched entirely based on Google, mm -hmm. you will know that it's a book which has been very superficially researched. That's where I think uh, I don't see it as a, as a challenge. I see it as simply one more tool in your ar arsenal to be able to make you a far better researcher and writer. Ashwin, from my personal research and experience, you've obviously come up with a bunch of amazing books, but Chanakya's chant was something that stood out for me as well in terms of some of the theories that you propounded on. Um, when we talk about leadership and lessons in leadership from that particular work of yours, and if we were to tell all the lovely people in the audience and everyone, the who's who of the B-School world, that this is a chapter. For instance, when I went to law school, there was law and literature. So the Merchant of Venice served as a great piece to understand Absolutely. common law systems and whatnot Absolutely. from medieval times. Similarly, if we had to take one chapter or one theme from, from your book about leadership or any other piece of yours, what would it be? Well, I think if, since we are going back to Chanakya's chant, I think if you look at two countries, China and India, I think one of the stark differences between China and India is that China level, never let go of Sun Tzu. Uh, and Sun Tzu, uh, in that sense, the art of war was almost made into a part of their DNA. It was imbibed. Uh, and one of the very uh, important things that uh, Sun Tzu said was that uh, if you can win a war without fighting, then it's better to win it without fighting. Right? Um, somewhere along the way, we lost out on Kautilya because we had no less profound wisdom available to us in India through Chanakya. Chanakya, in that sense, uh, if you read the Arthashastra, says the prosperous one becomes the victorious one. That's pretty much the same thing that uh, Sun Tzu is saying. So, in that sense, and if you really think about it, uh, in the 1970s, we were at the same GDP level between China and India. And then today, you know, now we are at about, they are about six times of our GDP. So maybe if we had taken some of that, this is one of the things where I genuinely feel that for the, the, the last 60 or 70 years, um, we could have taken so much, imbibed so much from the, from the statecraft, the wisdom, the leadership, the economic theory, which was available to us right within the Arthashastra itself. I mean, when I read the Arthashastra for the first time, I thought that I was reading an ancient day McKinsey manual. Uh, uh, how wide should a chariot road be so that one chariot can overtake another? Or for example, what should be the slope of that road so that the water drains? Or how frequently should you uh, should you pay a salary to your armed forces so that they are motivated but yet hungry enough to fight? Uh, I mean, those are managerial incentives and disincentives that we talk about. Uh, but it's provided within the Arthashastra. Uh, he even talks about, for example, what should be the time planning of a king? What time should he wake up and what should he be doing at what time of day? Mm -hmm. So there were so many lessons to be imbibed. If there is one takeaway from all of the research that I have done Absolutely. over the last 10 or 15 years is that we are a treasure house of wisdom. And I think we owe it to ourselves to be able to once again revisit that and make it available to people in the simplest of terms. We don't need to have such a distance between, I mean, you know, there, there are so many people who say, say, oh, you wrote Chanakya, Chanakya, you know that... He's the Indian Machiavelli. I, I say, do you realize that Machiavelli was 1800 years after Kautilya? And there is no comparison in terms of the breadth and depth of the material that has been covered. Uh, you can't compare the Prince and Arthashastra, but the average person doesn't know that. So we need to make this digestible. We need to make it comfortable enough to be able to consume.
That's true, actually. You know, if throughout my time studying political science, I had read The Prince and the learnings from there, but I had to read your book to get that sort of perspective from the other Shastra. That said, Ashwin, you know, we have a little bit of time left. When we're talking about your long meandering path to getting to pursuing your passion, I'd love to understand from a South Bombay family which had a set business, uh, you know, some great, uh, some great things all, of, all over the city. Was there any resistance from especially your parents, and I'm guessing a lot of B-school aspirants would be wondering this as well, to really genuinely pursue the, the stereotype of pursue your passion, right? Was, yeah. that, was there some resistance, some reluctance? Was it overall across the joint family and the business? Was there any sort See, of friction? I was born in a family that is half Banya, half, half Marwadi. So it is a deadly combination. Uh, and uh, it is taken for granted that pretty much you're going to be in the world of business. Uh, when I was writing a book called The Vault of Vishnu, I came across this wonderful little anecdote which talked about the merchants of Samarkand. And when a child used to bo be born in the uh, merchant family, uh, they would touch a drop of honey to the tongue of the child and they would touch a drop of glue to the palm of the child. And that was supposedly so that when he grew up, he would have a tongue as sweet as honey so that he could sell anything to anyone and that he would have a sticky palm so that coins would stick to the palm. Uh, and in that sense, my cultural upbringing was a lot like that. That it was taken for granted ki ye karna hai, gaddi pe aake baitna hai aur kaam karna hai. Correct. And when uh, my, uh, I decided sometime around 2005, 2006, and I went up to my father and I, you know, by the way, the, the Rosabal line initially had to be self-published. So it was self-published by me, but it was self-published under a pseudonym because I didn't want my family to know that I had done something. But you changed that eventually, La with later being on. persuaded to do later so. Later on. But I didn't want my family to know that I had written a book, so I wanted it to be a completely distinct and separate part of me. Uh, and then, of course, finally, when 2008, it was published in India, the publisher said, look, we can't have you using a pseudonym. Uh, we need you because the, the material requires that you should stand behind the material. So it needs you. Uh, and that's the time when I took the book to my father and I gave it to him and I said, see, this book has been published. And I could see instantly that his face dropped. Uh, and it was almost as if he was having these nightmares of me uh, wearing a khadi kurta and stringing a jhola along, uh, wearing a pair of chappals and becoming a lekhak. And I said, no, no, remember one thing. There is, the fact of the matter is that I cannot support myself because I don't know whether there will be any royalty checks. So whether, whether I like it or not, I'm going to have to work. And so from all, all the way from, the Rosapal was line was written between the midnight hours of 10.30 and 1.30 in the morning on several days of the week. And even after 2008, I continued working almost full time all the way up to 2012. Uh, it was only in my part time, I would be writing in the car Right. There would be times when I would be uh, getting up at odd hours and sneaking in an hour here or there. So that's what, when very often people tell me that, listen, can I indulge in this passion? I only tell them one thing, that listen, don't lose the day job. Carry on the day job and indulge in whatever passion you want along the way. And then once you have tested the waters and the income kicks in, mm -hmm. that's the time when you can actually make that transition. What an absolute pleasure hosting you, Ashwin. Brilliant, dynamic, articulate, and the art of storytelling. Powerhouse of talent, Ashwin Sangi. Can we have a huge round of applause? And thank you for being a lovely audience.